Hello, I'm Daniel Watson, pastor of First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma. We are a local church with a worldwide vision of reaching out to people with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. For the next few minutes, we want to reach out to you through the messages preached in this broadcast. As you watch this message, we pray that God will speak to your heart and that your life will be forever changed by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name.
Carol, I want to ask you if you will come up here and share with the church what you told me this morning in a, in a text message. Church, I want to tell you, God is still in the business of answering prayer. Amen. The days of miracles is not over. We've been praying for Sister Carol Oliver. What's, what stage have they said you were in? I want you to explain to them what's been going on and then and then tell them what you told me this morning. Okay. I've been battling uh, stage four cancer since 2016. I've been working and um, recently uh, resigned due to the uh, being so sick and hospitalized and everything. But um, this thing's going around in me. I get clear. It keeps going around in me, but I still have faith. And every time, it's hard to keep your faith up. And you just have to tell the Lord, the devil, rebuke him, get behind me. Because that's not what it's going to be. Even if it does come up like that, I always give faith. Because it's his will, whatever's going to happen, is going to happen. But today, um, after battling uh, edema, swelling on the brain and stuff from it, I went, I had an MRI and came back. And I was sitting in that room and I was like, this is, it's got to be good. I was like, you know, every time, I'm scared to even hear the good, but I trusted in faith in the Lord and prayed. <coughs> I've been up here several times, and another church and they anointed me and prayed for me. And the elders, that's a big part of the church and the family surrounding yourself, and that support means a lot. And so I went, you know, on my way and went to the doctor. And um, he came in, and he was pretty happy with the results. And, he says, I don't, he goes, whatever you're doing, it's working. He said, um, just keep doing that, which right now I'm on pinos. It's a chemo pills instead of the infusions. But there's a lot of roller coaster up and down with side effects of that. And I just push through and I look to him. I've overcome anxiety, like being in the tunnel with all the noise. I just see God, you know, his hands, his arms around me and the, the light. And I'm like, I've sat through, you know, half an hour of that before. I could not, it, it was like claustrophobic, but I've overcome that and everything. So I'm facing this head on. But the tumor, the stuff that was going on with me, it's all completely gone except for one spot that's half its size. So I see more prayers in the future. So he's still working on me. So I can I'm up and down with my sickness, and stomach, and everything else. But I know I always, re you know, turn to Him. Amen. You know, I'm, I'm kind of torn. I wanted to talk to you about that because it's like, you know, I love the Lord, and I'm ready. To get, you know, if that happens, I'm, I see my grandfather. Was, grandfather was a preacher, and I, I miss them dearly. But then it's like, I'm, like I love my family and everyone. I'm making sure, you know, they've got to get that in their heart so they can come see me again one day because that will eventually happen but I'm not going to look he's still, the, the Lord's telling me he's still working on me so Amen. I'm seeing you know things happen and I sure appreciate it Amen. Amen. Well, this is our eighth week in our study on the gospel of John and tonight I want to preach to you or talk to you for just a moment on the subject so close but too far away. John chapter 5, verse 1 through 47. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And this lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. 
But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus, and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The hour is coming. And now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, and the which all that, that are in the grave shall hear his voice too, and shall come forth that they have they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another witness that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. But I received not testimony from man. But these things I say, that ye might be saved. He was a burning and shining light, yet ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Search the scripture. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, 
him you will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that will accuse do not think that will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had you believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? These people were close to believing in a sense, but yet they were so far from the truth of understanding, in fact, who Jesus was. So tonight, as we look into John's Gospel, chapter 5, I want to speak to you about being so close, but yet so far away. A lot of times in life, we set goals that we want to accomplish throughout our life. Sometimes we have what we call a bucket list. We have all of these things in life that we want to accomplish. And, and a lot of times in life we set these goals and, we, and when we are children we make plans of, of what we want to do when we grow up. And, and so we start attending school at the age of five and, and we study and we make the grades that are needed in order to pass on to the, to the next level. And each year this process is repeated over and over again. And sometimes people know when they are young what they want to be. And so they begin to study toward that goal. And, and but then throughout the process of time, they get distracted. And they begin to make excuses of why they're not trying to accomplish that in their life anymore. And, and sometimes they may say, well, I'm close to graduating, but there's several more semesters to go. They're so close, but yet they're so far away. They may say, you know, I was close to passing that final exam. That they were really close to passing, but still they failed the class. They got discouraged. They dropped out of school. And although they were close to passing, although they were close to making the grade that they needed, they were still far away from reaching the goal. And it was never accomplished in the end. Being close to the answer is the same as not having an answer at all. Some people may say, well, I'm getting close to having a breakthrough in my life. When in reality, they're still struggling with the same thing they've always been dealing with. I'm close to getting a job. That means you're still employed. But I'm close. I'm close to getting there. I'm close to becoming a Christian. But yet they're still lost. They're still destined to spend eternity in hell. Being close to something, being close to accomplishing something, accomplishes nothing. Think about that. We were close to having it done. In reality, it's not done. It's not complete. So, for a moment, as we, before we get into John chapter 5, I want us to reflect what we looked at last Wednesday night in John chapter 4, where we see the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. You see, this woman that was at the well of Sychar, at Jacob's well, she was close to the miracle that she could experience in her life. See, Jesus was there. He was talking with her, but she did not even recognize that Jesus was the Messiah. She was so close, but far away from the truth. This woman, she had been married five times. The man that she was with was not even her husband. She was living in an adulterous relationship. She may have been close to living right. She may have been close to getting married again. She may have been close to having a right relationship with God. But she was living a life that was far away from the truth. She knew about worship. In fact, she tried to convince Jesus that she knew all about worship. She said, our fathers have worshipped on this mountain and our ancestors have worshipped on this mountain. It's the way we've always done it and, and this is how it's got to be. We know what we're doing. She knew the traditions of religion. She was close to the truth. And she was having it all together, but yet she was far away from having it deep inside of her life. But Jesus revealed the truth of God's love to this woman. And the Bible says that she believed in what Jesus said. And when she believed, once she realized who Jesus was, the Bible says that she began to run through the village and she began to cry out to people, come and see a man who told me everything that I ever knew. She was so close, but she was so far away. But once she came to Jesus, he made the difference in her life. 
And the Bible goes on to tell us that many people in the Samaritan village believed in the word of God because of this woman's testimony. The people were coming to know Jesus Christ. What would have happened if the woman at this well had only come close to believing in Jesus? See, she went on and she accepted the word of God. She accepted the message that Jesus told her. But what would have it been like had she only halfway believed? Halfway accepting means you don't accept it at all. That means that the Samaritan village would have never heard about the gospel of Christ because they heard from this woman. She was the one that told people about Jesus. She said, come and see a man named Jesus. Samaria would have never had the revival that they had. It all started because this woman at the well in Sychar, at Jacob's well, she realized that she was close to living right. She was close to having a right relationship. She was close to living righteously. But in reality, she was not accomplishing any of that. So she might as well have not have been close at all. It wasn't until she knew who Jesus was. When she met Jesus, that's when he began to bridge the gap in her life that, that took care of that, that separation between her life and God. And through her testimony, many people believed in the Word of God. In fact, the Bible tells us about a, an army general's son who had been sick and Jesus healed this official son. All he did was believe that Jesus would heal him and Jesus spoke the Word and He said, Go in faith, your son is well. What if that man had only halfway believed? What if he just come close to believe? What if this man whose son was very sick with a high fever, what if he was only just close to believing? See, if he was just close to believing, he probably would have said, Lord, I, I, I know you've healed people in the past and, and I know you might be able to heal my son even though he's not here where you can touch him, but I'm just really not sure that you can do it. His son would have stayed sick. His fever probably would have gotten higher. His son more than likely would have died. But it's because of the faith of this man that his son was healed and this young man was healed. He was now a testimony of the saving and the healing power of Jesus Christ. One person can make all the difference. See, your faith can make a difference in someone else's life. Your faith and the healing power of Jesus Christ may be what it takes to see a miracle take place in someone else's life. You see, when we have a belief and when we have faith in the saving power and the healing power of Jesus Christ, that may be what it takes to see a revival break out in our family. And when we have revival that breaks out in our family and in our individual lives, then we're going to see revival break out in a church. See, when people get on fire for God, when people realize that we serve a God who's greater than any other thing in this world, who's able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask or think, when we realize that we are nothing without Him, when we realize that it's not by might nor by power, but it's by His Spirit, and we let God come in and we let Him take charge of our life, that's when He begins to make the difference that this world cannot understand. You see, people in your family or in your neighborhood or people that you work with or go to school with, they may see that you go to church. They may know that you're different and they never go. But if they can see just a little bit of faith in your life, if they can see a difference in what God is doing in your life, if they can see the love that you have for Jesus Christ, if they can see the blessings that God is pouring out in your life, they're going to want the same thing that's taking place in your life to take place in their life. And they're going to come to you and to and ask you, tell me what you're doing in your life. Tell me, why are you so blessed? Tell me, how did you get healed? Tell me, how did you overcome cancer? And you say, it's not anything that I have done, but it's what God has done because God has saved me. God has blessed me. God has turned my life around and He's made a difference in my life. And if He changed me, He can change you too. Amen. See, that kind of faith can change an environment. And so we're looking at these miracles that Jesus did and it happened because people did not settle for just ha having an almost relationship or having just a close relationship, but they wanted to have an experience and they wanted that experience to be not just a one-time experience, but they wanted it to be an every day, every minute, every second, every hour relationship with the Savior of this world. 
And so when we look at John chapter 5, we see another miracle of someone who was experiencing being so close to the miracle, but yet so far away. See, we see the miracle of Jesus healing this lame man beside the pool of Bethesda. And inside the city of Jerusalem, the Bible tells us that north of the temple of Jerusalem was a pool of water that was fed by a hot spring. And the water in this pool was known to have healing power. And the Bible says that every day crowds of people covered the porches that surrounded this pool of water. Now this pool of Bethesda was surrounded by porches there north of the temple. And on each porch there were people who were blind, people who were lame, they were paralyzed. They were facing all kinds of problems in their life. You know, they were coming to this spring of water that that had healing power, some kind of a, a hot spring, and they would go into this water, and as they would come up out of this water, they would receive strength and healing in their body. Now, I don't know how it works. I don't know why it is that if you have pain and you're dealing with some severe muscle pain or maybe pain in your feet or in your back, and, and yet you can go and sit in a, a, a hot tub of hot salt water, something about that water just makes you feel better. And so this is a very similar situation of what we're seeing here in Jerusalem. They were coming from everywhere to come and sit in this hot water and let the, the, the minerals in this water, this healing power of this pool of Bethesda, give them strength and, and soothing the pain that was in their life. And so we're looking at the story here of this man. The Bible mentions a man who was at the pool of Bethesda. He had been sick. For 38 years. Imagine being sick for 38 years. That's my age plus one more year. I, I feel like I'm at death's door when I get sick for one day. I cannot imagine suffering like that. And, and the Bible says that this man was slain and, and daily he was brought in. Someone had to carry him in uh, up there by the temple to sit him down beside the pool of Bethesda. And so for 38 years... Through every summer, through every winter, through every fall, through every spring, this man was enduring pain and infirmity in his life. He's just sitting out there, out there beside the pool of Bethesda, never going inside it, never experiencing the healing power of Bethesda, but yet he's sitting there right here every day, sitting right here beside a place where he could get healing, but he never takes one step to get inside it. The water. See, for 38 years, he was doing that. He was so close to his source of healing, but yet too far away. He was close to the water, but because he did not step into the water, he was far away from his miracle. He received no relief. He received no change. There was no relief in sight for this man. In fact, the only thing that was ever going to relieve this man in the condition that he was going through was whenever he dies and goes into eternity. Because he was not getting well. He was not overcoming that pain. And when we read of sicknesses in a case like this, we need to remember how important it is in our life to stay away from sin. Because when we look at the problems and the sufferings and the things in this world that we deal with, all of the pain, all of the hurt, all of the sorrow, the original root cause of it is sin. Now please do not misunderstand it. I'm not telling you that if you are sick, it's because of sins that you're doing in your life. It goes much further back than that. It goes back to the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. God did not create mankind to be full of aches and pains and infirmities. He created man in his own image, in his own likeness, to live forever and to live a life that is pleasing and that would glorify God and bring glory and honor to his name. But it's because of sin in the Garden of Eden that a curse fell on this entire world. And every generation that has ever lived since that time has dealt with problems. We've had pain, we've had sorrow, we've had sickness, we've had incurable disease. And it all started because somebody messed up in the Garden of Eden. See, no greater proof can be shown of man's stubborn unbelief than the carelessness about sin. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 9, Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is faith. 
See, people are taught over and over, it's preached in our churches, that, that, that the only cure for sin, the only cure, it's not by our works, it's not by our good deeds, but the only cure for sin is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, who was wounded for our transgression, who was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes, we are healed. There is no other way to salvation. There is no other power that can save us. There is no other way for salvation. In fact, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He said, no man can come unto the Father but by me. But every day we see that people are constantly rejecting His grace. They're rejecting His authority. They have no respect for God. They have no respect for the house of God. They have no respect for the Word of God. And, and all the time they're wanting relief from the problems of this world. They want to have relief from their pain. They want to have relief from their suffering. But yet they don't want anything to do with the ultimate source of that relief. They're so close but they're so far away. And so this man, sitting at the pool of Bethesda, when Jesus came to this man and he saw the condition that he was in, he knew that he had been like this for a long time. He sees this man sitting at the pool of Bethesda. He'd been sitting there for 38 years. And Jesus asked this man, he said, Wilt thou be made whole? You see, in order for this man to get well, in the natural sense, he would have to quit sitting on the edge and actually get inside the water. But this man had an excuse. He said, every time I come to the pool of Bethesda, keep in mind, someone had to carry him to get there. He didn't have the strength to walk. But he said, every time I come to the pool of Bethesda, and every time the water starts to bubble up, someone else always gets right in here in front of me, and they steal my blessing, and then I can't get healed. And I'm thinking, really? For 38 years, sitting on the sideline, sitting right here beside his miracle, healing was just a few feet away. All he had to do was just slide into the water. What, who brought him there? How did he get to the pool of Bethesda? Why didn't the person bring him? Why didn't he just tell them, don't just drop me beside the pool, but just throw me into that pool. If that pool is the source of my blessing, throw me in. And sure, sometimes I wonder, some of us, we, we've been sitting so close to our miracle. We've been sitting so close to a breakthrough in our life. We've been sitting so close to a healing. We've been sitting so close to salvation. We've been sitting so close to the baptism of the Holy Ghost where the evidence is speaking in other tongues. And a lot of times when the altar call is given, we might come up here for a little bit. We might, we might be too afraid to get too close to the front. So we'll stand right here and, and we just might lift our hands for a little bit and, and peek around and see if anyone's watching. Then we'll go back to our seat. We, we come up here, we got a little close, but yet we were so far away. I wonder what would happen, church, if we got to a point that said, I don't care what else is going to take place. I am in a desperate situation. I am lost. And I am in need of a miracle. I am in need of a change. And I cannot bring this change into my own life. And I know there was a place of healing. I know there was a place where I could be changed. I know there was a place where a life can be changed. And a healing can be take place. I know of a place where there can be an anointing. I know of a place where my sins can be forgiven. I know of a place where my life can be filled with the anointing. In church, all you got to do is just get to an altar of prayer because it's at the altar of prayer that God can touch your heart. It's at the altar of prayer where sins can be forgiven, where lives have changed, where people are set free by the power of the Holy Ghost, where you can be filled with His anointing and power. So close, but so far away. You see, people make up excuses all the time. In their life, they make up excuses for why they sin. They make up excuses for their addictions. They make up excuses of why they do not seek the will of God in their life. This lame man had made excuses of why he could not be healed. Jesus wasn't going to accept that. He wasn't going to let this lame man continue to, to stay in his lame condition. And Jesus clearly told the man, He said, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. And the Bible says that instantly this man was healed. 
He rolled up his mat and he began to walk. Now all of this happened after 38 years. 38 years of sitting beside his miracle and he never got his healing. But once the source of miracles came on the scene, he wasn't going to accept this man's excuses any longer. He said, will thou be made whole? He was giving this man an opportunity here. He said, you have no more excuses left. He said, the source of your miracle is here. Arise and take up your bed and walk that man showed his face, faith right there when he did, when he was obedient to what Jesus said. He believed. He finally took that step of faith and believed he could have disobeyed Jesus and not did what he said and, and remains in that same condition. But finally, this man's eyes were open and he realized the source of healing had stood right there in front of him. And he said, arise, take up your bed and walk. And the man did exactly as Jesus said. And it was because of that faith there that this man received his healing. You see, thousands of people today, they do the things which are evil and, and they're greedily running after the things that are downright poison in this world. They love the things that God prohibits. And they dislike the things that God likes. They know the truth. They know what God wants. They know what God's Word says. They're so close to reality, but yet they're so far away from the truth that they will just look to Jesus Christ because He is the way. He is the truth and the life. He can make the difference that they need. For 38 years, this man was so close to a source of healing. He never experienced it. He was just too far away from getting in. But when he met Jesus, once he was obedient to Jesus, when he met the one who was the healer, when he met the one who was our ultimate sacrifice for sin, the one who was wounded for our transgressions, who was bruised for our iniquity, the one who by his stripes were healed. When he met Jesus, he was instantly healed and his life was forever changed. See, just at this time, Jesus healed this man. Just at the time when it looked like things was going well, someone had to find fault in what was going on. Let me tell you something, church. Just because God brings a breakthrough in your life, just because you get filled with the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues, just because we have a good service here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, good service on prayer meeting, doesn't mean that life is going to be a bed of roses when you go back to work the next day. Amen. Literally, this world, hell itself, could come against you. That's when you've got to remain strong. That's when you've got to know in whom you have believed. What was going on here is this. Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath day. To the Jewish people, that was the worst thing he could have ever done. The Jewish day of rest. Why? No one was allowed to work on that day. It's the Sabbath day. And so the, 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 the Jews are wanting to persecute Jesus. They're trying to find some way to slay Jesus. Now, this man who had been laying, sitting beside the pool of Bethesda for 38 years, he's now healed. He's carrying his sleeping mat. He's carrying his bedding. I'm sure it's comparable to like a small mattress or a couple of blankets or quilts. The Jewish leaders of the community, they saw him carrying all of those sheets and his mattress and everything. And, and they looked at him and they thought, the nerve of you, why are you carrying all of this? Don't you know it's a Sabbath day? Don't you know you're going to burn in hell for, for working? After all, it's a lot of work to carry bedding material. And this man spoke up and he said, I'm just doing what I was told. The one who said, take up thy bed and walk. The one who made me well. The one who healed me. He said to do this. And so I'm doing what he said to do. Well, then now they want to go after Jesus. And they're, they're asking, well, why would Jesus tell you to do that? Why, why would he do this? It's against our rule. It's against the law to do any kind of work on the Sabbath day. You see, the Jewish leaders knew the claim of Jesus to be the Son of God. And so they started trying to persecute Jesus. But Jesus replies to them. He said, my father is always working. He said, my father who created the Sabbath day is working. And I am working. Well, now this upset the Jewish leaders, the priests and the Pharisees even more. See, now they want to try to find a way to kill Jesus. They don't like Jesus. They don't like what He stands for. They want Him stopped. See, that's just like what the devil does in our world today. Every time 
We've got an answer. Every time we get a victory in our life, every time God does something good in our life, someone else is going to try to come up and try to criticize you and try to tell you, you know, what, what you're doing is really wrong. You shouldn't be shouting in church like that. You shouldn't be dancing around like that. You're just making an idiot of yourself trying to draw attention to your life. Anyone ever been told that? You don't have to raise your hands. But it happens. It happens. People are trying to criticize us. They're trying to say, you know, I don't want to go to that Pentecostal church because, you know, they're, they're going to gather around you and they're going to lay hands on you. And, and, you know, I'm thankful for that. Because when we come together, I love it that we can come and we pray together. Because that's what Jesus said to do. He said, where two or three are gathered together in my name. He said, two or three of you agree together as touching anything on earth as in heaven it shall be done. When we pray according to the will of God, when we pray according to the word of God, God will answer prayer. You know, I don't know if I can have enough patience to deal with the priests and Pharisees like Jesus did. But Jesus explained to them. He said, I tell you the truth. I can do nothing by myself. I can only do what I see the Father do. And whatever the Father does, I do the same thing also. He said, because the Father loves the Son and shows the Son everything He is doing. In fact, what you have just seen is only a preview of the things to come. Because there are even greater things to come. The Father will show me even greater works than healing this lame man. Greater works than healing the sick. Greater works than turning water into wine. You see, this was nothing for Jesus. He was telling these priests and Pharisees, he said, there's going to come a time when there's going to be dead people laying in the graves and those whose lives have been redeemed, those whose lives are righteous, when they hear my voice, they're going to come forward to an eternal of righteousness. He said, those who have lived a life of unrighteousness, they're going to be raised to an eternal damnation. Eternity in hell, lost forever without God. He said, you haven't seen nothing yet. That's a whole sermon in itself. We could preach a message right here called, you haven't seen nothing yet. You think this miracle is good? Wait till you see what he's got next. Church, there's no limit to God's power. Yeah. Jesus goes on to tell the Jewish leaders in John chapter 5, verse 24 through 30. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can in my own self do nothing as I hear. I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. You see, this lame man that was healed by Jesus Christ is also a testimony to the healing power that Jesus can still heal, that he can still save. See, Jesus doesn't have to do anything to defend himself. There's people all over this world. There's people in this church. Sister Carolyn, even tonight, can testify to the healing power of Jesus Christ. You see, the fact is, when we see the miracles, when we see the signs and wonders, that in itself speaks for the power of Jesus Christ. The people that Jesus touched, they are a testimony to the goodness and the power of Jesus Christ. You see, these Jewish leaders of Jerusalem, they were religious in their own thinking. They had all the traditions right. They had all of the rituals. They knew what the Scripture said. And they obeyed the law of Moses. And they thought they were being obedient to the Scriptures. They were so close to having a right relationship with God, but they lacked one important thing. They lacked the relationship. They did not have the relationship. Being close to having a relationship is the exact same thing not having one at all. Yeah. Jesus told them in John chapter 5, verse 3 through, or, or uh, in John chapter 5, uh, after verse 30, 37 through 44. Search the scripture, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, and you will not come to me that you might have life. 
I receive not honor from men, but I know that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? You see, if when we start trying to seek for honor in our own life, we're not going to see the power of the Holy Spirit. In, in churches all across our country today, all across this world, churches are filled with people who all they want to do is praise and honor their self. That they're naming churches after the pastor. Uh, have this great name that says so-and-so ministries. Forget about the name of Jesus. It's all about them. Heaven forbid that my name ever goes out on the front of this place and says Daniel Watson Ministries. It's not about me. It's to give glory and honor to God. This is the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's His church. He said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're so close sometimes to having the truth be yet so far away. When you're close to the truth, that means it's still a lie. That means there's no truth whatsoever. But this man at the pool of Bethesda, he came into contact with something that was real. He came into the source of strength. He came in contact with the, the source of our strength and the strength of our life. He came in contact with the one who was able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. And his name is Jesus Christ. The one that John spoke of as the Lamb of God who came into this world because he's a Lamb of God who takes away the sins of this world. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, it talks about people that are close to living rights, but yet they're so far away from the truth. They're wrapped up in their own thinking. They're, they're doing their own thing, not thinking about what's right. They're not in the will of God, but they want to do it their way. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, that not everyone who calls out, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of the Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. In other words, they're saying, we cast out demons in your name. We did many works in the church in your name. We were there every time the doors were open. We were there every time we had an activity. We worked in the outreach. We knocked on doors. We were there every time we could be there. And Jesus is going to look at them and say, I don't know. I never knew they were so close to living right. They were so close to the truth that they did everything they thought was right, but yet they lacked one important thing. They did not have the relationship. So close, but so far away. See, they were close to having everything together. They were close to having forgiveness. They were close to being saved. They were so close to salvation, but so far away. See, if there's anything in our life that keeps us from God, why wait another minute? We need to ask God to change us. Ask Him to forgive us. See, so many people, they want to put it off until a later date. They want to wait till tomorrow. They want to wait till, you know, I, I, they, they think they're so young and they've got so much time on their hand. And they say, you know, I've got lots of time. I want to do what I want to do. I want to live like I want to live. I just want to have fun. And all of a sudden, something tragic happens in their life. And in an instant, they go into eternity. Lost and undone without Jesus Christ. Why? It's because they settled for having almost a relationship with Jesus Christ. They were so close to coming to an altar one day. They were so close to living for God. They were so close to having the truth in their hearts. But so close to having the truth in their hearts still means they're living a lie. Church, we must make sure in our life that we don't settle for almost don't settle for just being close. But ask God, Lord, just I want to get in the pool. I don't want to just be beside us. I want to be in the pool. If there's going to be a, a pool of blessings, then I want to be right there in the middle of it. If we could just have a, a pool of water out here, symbolic of a, of a blessing of God, I say just I want to get right in the middle and I want to get down and underneath it because I want the blessing of God to be all around me, above me, and then underneath me and inside me. I want the blessing of God. I, I'm reminded of, of a time, one time, the, the, the great waterfall in, in Niagara Falls. I found this very fascinating a story that I heard about it that 
the water never stops. It's constantly flowing. They cannot stop the water. And they said years ago in the late 1800s, there was a great ice storm and the, the chunks of ice began to collect and, and it formed an ice jam and, and all that water began to back up and for days and days that waterfall stood silent. Not a bit of water was coming through. Why? Because something was stopping the water. But all of a sudden, one day, that water pressure kept building up. It kept building up, and it began to overflow that ice jam. And as that warmer water began to overflow that ice jam, all of a sudden, that ice jam broke, and that water began to gush down that river again as a thunderous roar, roar shaking that entire community as the water began to gush down that waterfall again. Sometimes that's the way it is in our life. God is trying to send a blessing into your life and through our own deeds and sometimes through our own thoughts we, we may uh, allow the devil himself to try to block that blessing but the blessing of God never stops the blessings of God continuously flow the blessing of God continuously moves and if his blessing has got to move if his anointing has some place to go then it might as well just flow through our life take away every blockade take away every distraction take away every obstacle and just let that river of life begin to flow into our heart and when you begin to do that it will be more than just living an almost life it will be more than just being close to your miracle because you will experience the power you will experience his grace you will experience His anointing that comes from God the Father, from the throne room of God Himself. Let the glory of God fill our heart because every problem that we face, every battle that we go through, the Bible tells us that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in our heart because greater is He that is in us than He that is in this world. Church, we must be determined yeah. that we're going to make it no matter what comes our way, no matter what people say about us, no matter what they do to us, we must have a determination to keep on going, to keep on going, to keep on believing, to keep on receiving because God has a work for each one of us. He has a plan for each one of our lives. And if God be for you, who can be against you? We can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony in Jesus' name. Church, would you stand with me across the sanctuary tonight? Thank you for watching today. If we have reached you, we would like to hear from you. You can visit us online at howag.com or you can write to us at First Assembly of God, P.O. Box 97, Howe, Oklahoma, 74940. We invite you to worship with us at First Assembly of God, Sunday morning Sunday school at 930, morning worship at 1040, Sunday evenings at 6, and Wednesday evenings at 7. We also invite you to subscribe to our online YouTube channel or visit our Facebook page. We hope that you can join us again soon for another service from First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma.